My call came on Thursday, January 2nd, 2003. It began with a knock on the door, a reluctant shuffle, a wrestling match between dope sick hands and a doorknob, and the eventual recognition that my sole hope lay with the woman who stood on my stoop. Sydney, Sydney, deep dark brown and doe-eyed Sydney, ever generous smile wrapping all in her warm. Sydney the beauty, clutching a box full of items she had stolen from me. Sydney the beauty, and now recovering Sydney. I hadn't seen Sydney in years. A parting of friendship like scores of others, crafted by chaotic drug use, incarceration, drug deals gone wrong, by overdose, and by death. To be honest, I had forgotten about Sydney. I had forgotten a lot. It was a purposeful forgetting. It was my escape. Escape, escape from pain, from rape, from torture, from the degradation of supporting myself by whatever means necessary. Escape from self, especially escape from self. Forgetting was my escape and dope was my forgetting. I became a slave to that forgetting. I forgot in mansions with movie stars and martinis. I forgot snorting on street corners with nighttime sisters and brothers and forgot while living in my car. I forgot at company parties and infrequent family affairs, but mostly I forgot by myself. I had forgotten Sydney. Sydney had not forgotten me. Sydney spoke. Sydney spoke in a voice both frightening and foreign. She spoke of dope, of sick, of pain she called her own. She also spoke of hope and healing. She spoke of hope for the heart, healing of the mind. She spoke her broken body up against mine. Sister to sister, she spoke, I will be with you. Sydney spoke of freedom from the bondage of history, of self, of freedom from the bondage of the need to forget, of freedom to choose life over death. Deep down and during her speaking me towards a consideration of that light, doubt shouted dope, drink, and dope once again. Doubt shouted my name, and I shouted dope. Surely not a derelict such as myself. A self that subsided on despair and deprivation could not make such a journey. From forgetting to freedom, from dying to surviving, surely not a derelict such as myself. I went to my first meeting on that Friday night. I went to my first meeting because I was out of dope. I went to my first meeting because I was tired of doing what I did to get by and to get off. I went to my first meeting because Sydney had gone before. I remember little about that meeting. I do remember feeling oddly intrigued by the burning bright and bliss of the speaker, which seemed entirely incongruous with his appearance and the history in his words. His words tumbled into the microphone clear, confident, in spite of the meth-made black and tooth barrier they crawled from behind. His face, much like his language, was pockmarked with scars, still lingering wounds and silences, infected with their want for safe release. Despite his disfigurement, he dove into a deep and deliberate dialogue with the devastation that dovetailed his drug use. I went to that first meeting on that Friday night because the fear in me and of me outsized the hope I had in the world. I went to that first meeting because I was not sure I was equipped to pay the price that a life in doubt and dope would cost. I went to that first meeting because Sydney went with me. Near the end of that meeting, a moment came wherein I heard the voices in my head contemplate life over death for the first time in months. That moment, punctuated by caffeinated fear and recognition, heard my heart read from a sign on the wall. Without help, it is too much for us, but there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find her now. 
I heard then that she had found me now, and I knew. I knew in that moment that living is what I was called to do. I knew in that moment that I was called to accept the love that sought me out, that remembered me, that recognized my suffering, that had experienced my suffering. I knew in that moment that I was called to move towards and work for the promise of freedom. I knew I was called to a faith in, I will be with you. I debated at great length about whether I would begin this message here, not because I imagine my story is one you have not heard and or experienced, not because I have regrets or shame about the many selves I have moved through and into up until this point, nor because I am apologetic about the incredibly resourceful ways I crafted and employed to move myself through trauma, to surviving and ultimately thriving, but simply because it is stigmatizing. Drug use, being a person who uses drugs or is in a process of recovery is stigmatizing. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Come to me, come to me with all of you. An invitation into relationship, an invitation to connection, an invitation to the inclusion of you in the all. For people who use drugs and the people who love them, this connection, this inclusion, this invitation, shaped by compassion and loving regard for the fullness of humanity, is the embodiment of harm reduction, is the expression of radical welcome, the welcoming of all stories and paths. It calls people by name and attends to and cherishes the particularities. It is a hospitality that seeks people out, meets them where they are, and invites them into loving community. Harm reduction says, come to me, all you. Come as you are. Drug use, alcohol use, smoking, chaotic use, use of illicit drugs, the myriad of ways in which people carry burdens that are beyond our ability to understand or relate to are deeply stigmatized. Stigma is the heaviest burden. Stigma destroys the hope that harm reduction offers. The stigma can be insurmountable, an opaque barrier to community and connection which obscures any vision of healing, movement towards wholeness. Stigma is both placed on, taken in. Stigma shapeshifts. Whole people created in the image of the most divine are redacted and fractured, reduced to behaviors, pathologies, criminality, projected upon with fear, worry, and misunderstanding are made other. Stigma permeates every cell, threatens to rupture the increasingly fragile tissue of life, relationships with family, friends, healthcare providers, communities of faith. While a great number of expectations are placed on people who use drugs to change their behaviors, the context, the social context that creates and reinforces drug-related stigma, that reinforces relations of power and control, that leads to status loss and discrimination for the stigmatized, is rarely explored or further challenged. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you. <coughs> Stigma renders the you invisible. Stigma does not allow for the recognition of self or you in all. Stigma dehumanizes and it wounds profoundly. The powerful manifestation of this wound limits access to opportunities and rights, to stable and healthy housing. It ensures under and unemployment. It fuels an industry of exclusion and deportation. It limits elevation through education. Stigma prevents people from seeking and completing drug treatment and from utilizing harm reduction services, syringe exchange programs, overdose prevention programs, and safer injection facilities. In a vicious cycle, 
Stigma drives people underground, deepens the harm, increases the need for services for healing. I acknowledge a very significant level of privilege in my story. As a white woman, as a white woman with an at times more robust than others bank account, network of friends and family, employers, educational opportunities, and a US passport, with access to services and spaces that saw people who looked like me, places where I recognized myself, I was able to pass, to move through the world beyond the gaze which others, which is violently suspicious of black and brown bodies, which criminalizes the conditions which contribute to substance use, poverty, homelessness, mental health issues, and which incarcerates people of color who use drugs at disproportionate and oppressive rates. My privilege afforded me a safety beyond the reach of the state, which polices what substances pregnant and parenting people can put in their own bodies, which questions their very personhood. Come to me, all you. I always saw reflections of me, of this you, in representations of the all. What a privilege. I knew that I was welcome. Sydney welcomed me. She welcomed me through story, through her own vulnerability. She spoke her broken body up against mine. Sister to sister, she spoke. Come to me, I will be with you. And Sydney went first. In this way, I feel it is our obligation to make this space to go first at Judson, in this pulpit, to make sacred space which invites people, all people, people who find themselves at the many margins, people who are creatively, desperately, intently, and faithfully struggling to find ways to carry their burdens. It is our obligation to make space for people to tell their stories, be their stories, and to tell and be their whole stories, to show up with their whole selves. It is my obligation to acknowledge the whole and the at times very complex and hard to hold to the light threads of my own story, that more people have an opportunity to see reflections of themselves, to see you, a part of you, reflected in me, to ensure that the many and most marginalized see themselves reflected in this divine whole we call community. Harm reduction says, come to me, all you, come as you are. It is a compassion that stands in awe of the burdens that people carry, rather than stands in judgment at how they carry it. It is a divine invitation. Come, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Come just as you are. You are right, loved, holy enough, no need to alter or fix, beloved. Beloved.